Hello all, and thank you so much for joining us today for our talk about Passive House and University Housing. Want to be sure to thank the organizers of NAPHM for all their efforts and for inviting us here to share this really important material with you today about our experience of making this dormitory for the University of Toronto Scarborough. So we, we put together a really interesting um, panel here. We're going to be hearing from Jennifer Adams Pepper. She is the campus architect for the University of Toronto Scarborough and she's been a critical member of the team that has been helping to make this very important decisions leading to this really groundbreaking building. So we're really looking forward to hearing her experiences. As well, we have Lois Arena, who is the brains behind making this project happen from a passive house standpoint. She has a lot of really great information to share about the proving out of passive house to the university, which is a very important step in making a lot of these passive house projects happen. And as well, I will be speaking of more of the integration of these ideas into the design and showing you through case study how the passive house design will be integrated into the project. You can receive AIA credit for this. And now we'll go through, I think it's important to stop here to look at a bit of an agenda of what we'll be speaking about. As I noted, Jennifer Adams Pepper will be discussing a bit of background to the project to show you how Toronto uh, Scarborough embraced the Passive Pass Design pathway. We'll be identifying the challenges to bring forward to those stakeholders and how we had to, as I noted, to prove out Passive House. And then we'll be talking about incorporating these into the dormitory design. So here we see a rendering of the final design at 100% design development. Uh, the University of Toronto Scarborough is actually a joint effort between the University of Toronto and Fengate Asset Management, a great partnership that's helping to make the project a reality. The project design team consists of Handel Architects, as well as the local core architects, which is a Toronto-based architecture firm who acts as the executive architect. We also have, of course, Stephen Winter Associates doing, um, helping us with sustainability compliance and Passive House, as well as the Integral Group helping with MEP and RWDI critical component to the design of the envelope. Getting you situated here, the project is located along Ellesmere Road in Scarborough. It faces due south, which is quite handy. And what's interesting in this picture is we're showing you here the building situated just to the east of the, what's considered the North Campus and the South Campus. And these campuses will now be sort of what we're calling linked with this building. So traffic coming from the east will go through, will sort of see this building as a marker, as an entryway to the campus. Currently, the main road, New Military Drive, dives through the campus in this location, but through a major renovation, the university is planning to reroute New Military Drive to run in the north-south direction adjacent to the new building. It will be breaking ground quite soon in August. We'll be achieving Passive House Classic Certification, Climate Zone 6, which we'll talk about further, the challenges of that. It's 270,000 square feet, which for those of you who know the Cornell Project, same square footage, but this one is only nine stories tall, is actually much denser than Cornell. This one has 752 beds as opposed to that 500 beds. And this is an undergraduate dormitory classic sort of dormitory with a dining hall and 1,700 meals per day. So now we're going to hear from Jennifer Adams Pepper, who is, as we noted, the campus architect, who will be discussing a bit of background to the project and the steps taken by the university to undergo this extremely ambitious project. Thank you, Deborah. Scarborough College, one of the two new campuses for the University of Toronto, broke ground a little over 50 years ago, opening in 1967. The original building that you see on the right hand side here um, was an iconic and robust brutalist building, um, but also deeply grounded in the landscape as it wrapped around the top of a ravine and a valley system below. The campus was also built at a time of great experimentation with technology, 
Um, and if communication theorist Marshall McLuhan might be quoted here, the medium was the message. Lecture halls were all equipped with back projection TV screens and lectures were recorded in an on-site recording studio. Although this for foray into technology didn't last long, it speaks to the campus as one that embraced innovation from the start. Today, our aspirations are not much changed. We remain deeply committed to design excellence. We seek to push boundaries and to be cutting edge and through this to influence change. And importantly for this talk, in an effort to be sustainable and environmentally friendly, we look to be leaders in the use of new and smart technologies and systems as we grow and build new. The image on the left-hand side is uh, taken from our environmental science and chemistry building that recently opened. Um, and I think this is a good example to show um, strategies that were employed in this building. Here we, um, we employed earth tubes at a huge scale uh, to temper air year round and this helped to offset what is by nature in a chemistry building an otherwise very leaky building. Over this 50-year trajectory, the Canadian undergraduate demographic has also dramatically changed. In the 70s, students were typically more mature and ready for independence. We built townhouses where groups of four and five students lived together in a family-type unit with responsibilities to cook and clean. Today, the typical incoming student is younger. There is more parental involvement and far greater expectations around comfort, where the energy burden of townhouses of the 70s was minimal, with no air conditioning, uh, no computers or technology, residential kitchens. Today, the entering student expects the comforts of home in their living space. They bring computers and gaming systems. They require individual refrigerators in their rooms. Um, they demand exciting, varied food options at the ready 24-7. Um, they have resident supervisors, programmed activities, and a variety of specialized spaces at their fingertips. And this all comes at the expense of tuition dollars and energy consumption. You can see our tuition dollars um, back in the 70s when, when our buildings were much simpler. Um, they were lower but they're not as, as much lower as we expected when we put this together. We, we thought that there would be a dramatic increase. But if you, if you know, notice, this 20% increase um, uh, in today's dollars doesn't buy us much. Um, and so we really needed in this building to find ways of, of saving money um, and energy is, is one of those ways um, that we, um, looked to, um, to move forward. So when we were considering building our first new residence building in almost 20 years, we looked for innovative ways of building. We looked to continue our commitment to energy reduction, to be global citizens in combating global warming, to offer the best environment for our students to live and work, one that was healthier, quieter, and forward thinking. Passive House ticked all of these boxes. Building as a teaching learning tool for a young and enthusiastic student body could build advocacy. Contractors and industry um, unfamiliar with Passive House techniques um, would be trained, growing a skilled population of trades for future developments. And the university uh, continues to be at the forefront of innovation. For those of you who are unfamiliar, most university processes are fraught with bureaucracy. This is no different at the University of Toronto. For us, to get an approved project is a long and complicated journey, one with many checks and balances. As a public university, we also have limited funding available for buildings, and priority goes to academic space first. We knew a funding partner would be necessary to bring capital to this project, and we found a like-minded partner in Fengate. But we still needed the confidence that this type of building could be affordable within our context. To educate ourselves and to start to build a case for building um, Passive House, um, we took a small group of us uh, and attended the Passive House Conference in Darmstadt in 2016. 
um, and again the following year in Vienna um, together with folks from Fengate and you can see um, some of us here dancing. Um, Passive House certainly knows how to party. We needed supportable evidence that Passive House would work with our type of complex institutional building that is residential, but that also includes a large dining hall, um, a marche type food court, teaching spaces, office spaces, and a variety of student amenity spaces. We needed confidence furthermore that Passive House could be supportable through our variety of boards and committees that review building projects from the perspective of academic budget and planning compatibility with the overall university mission and vision. And we needed this building to fit within the university's overall sustainability approach. Since the 70s, we've been continually looking to improve the ways we operate and build. Nevertheless, despite the lower energy loads, even up to 20 years ago, the campus ran on largely dirty energy, including oil. Utility costs were high and the greenhouse gas emissions were also high. Since this time, we've made a significant change on campus to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and energy use overall. That said, we continue to try to do better and to set target goals that push limits. We saw Passive House as a new and innovative way to continue along this path. And here, you know, you can see it's, it's interesting that utility costs and greenhouse gas emissions were much higher <laughs> um, 20 years ago. Um, but that really just shows that trajectory that we're on uh, and the desire to continue to do better. We chose the design build bridge method of project delivery as a further fail safe. We needed to understand not only that this type of building methodology worked for us in terms of its outputs, but we needed to be confident that this building would work in our Toronto context. The design build bridge method allowed us to work closely with a team of experts to develop a DD set and a very detailed set of requirements. Finally, we needed to be confident in our ability to affordably move forward with this project in a market that had limited to no experience um, in Passive House and where the materials and building systems were for the, for the most part yet to come to the North American market. Having rigorously des designed a set of um, details, um, drawings, allowed for a cost estimation um, before going to the market and helped us to know better that the what the market could bear. Once tendered as a design build project, then the original design team moved to act on our behalf as the owner's representative and continue to main that, maintain that continuity throughout the design process um, and now into construction. We developed our original RFP to get this result. The RFP required the successful team to explore options and to educate other deciding parties. The successful consultants were brought to the table early to help gain city staff um, approvals and understanding of Passive House um, and to work with them on how such a project would navigate the municipal approvals pathway. To this end, we needed the consultants to demonstrate compatibility with the City of Toronto Tier 3 Green Standards. At the same time, the university had been working through energy targets and, at the time, was requesting 40% better than ASHRAE. We needed the team to demonstrate how this target might be met while pursuing Passive House. Lois and Deborah can attest to these complicated comparisons that we asked for and how they compared and contrasted the various targets to gain understanding and buy-in. Thanks, Jennifer. It's really exciting to hear about how the university is progressing and is like leading sustainability efforts on the campus. It's amazing. Um, and so I'm going to speak a little bit more to the last few things that Jennifer talked about, about how we, we proved that Passive House was a viable option that it would save energy and that it was the best pathway forward. Um, and we also were involved with, you know, financial evaluations as well, which is very typical from our perspective. As an as experienced team, you know, it's our job to take our, our 
clients and the owners and the developers through the process to let them know the pros and cons of different methods and technologies and help them quickly make decisions. And that's really what we focused on as we got engaged in this project. So the first step was to just show them the possibility for energy reduction. What does that mean on a building wide basis? And what we showed them originally was the analysis we had done for the house at Cornell Tech in New York and Roosevelt Island. And that, that building was built to the past fail standard. Um, and we compared it to the typical multifamily New York building that we uh, that have been uh, collecting data for years in New York on these types of buildings. It's called local law 84 data. Um, and so we, the average source energy use intensity for these types of large scale multifamily buildings is around 130,000 BTUs per square foot per year. And when we compared the predictions for the house to the built to the passive house standard, we're looking at over a 50% reduction in source energy down at 50 kBTU per square foot per year. So the, the potential for energy savings predicted anyway at the beginning of the project is very, very large and definitely um, would help deal with some, uh, UTSC deal with some of the high energy costs that they've been dealing with and the need to save money on these projects due to the increased uh, demands of, of student life these days. So one of the, the other issues that had come up in the past for UTSC was that buildings of this type that are so large and so dense and have a very, very high person per square foot, which means they have a very high plug load per square foot, is that meeting the passive house standard can be difficult when you're looking at the whole building energy demand. Now, we, we still meet the maximum for the heating demands. We still have to meet the maximum for the cooling demand. But what Passive House Institute has done over the last several years for us is evaluate North American large scale buildings, in particular multifamily, because we've been, we've been talking to them for years that the whole building energy use for these buildings is so much higher than the standard for whole building that passes house's typical standard. So their typical standard for whole building energy demand was 120 kilowatt hours per meter square. But when we start modeling these types of buildings, we can see we bump up against that threshold immediately and surpass it. I mean, if you think about it, you have all of these students per square foot, right? Only a couple hundred square feet per student. Each one has a mini fridge, each one has a laptop, you know? So you, when you start to add up all of that information and then you've got common area lighting and hallway lighting that needs to stay on 24 seven to a certain extent. So what happens is the plug loads and the lighting and appliance loads do just grow astronomically compared to a typical low rise or single family home. So Plasmas Institute created a special calculator for us to deal with high density projects. And when we use that calculator, we come up with a threshold of approximately 222 kilowatt hours per meter square per year, almost double what their standard is, right? So when we presented this to UTSC, we, we wanted to show them, look, there's pathways forward for really dense buildings. Just because you have a high energy use per square foot by nature, doesn't mean you can't follow the passive house standard. And what we also showed them were several other projects um, that we had analyzed over the last few years that way far surpassed the, um, the, the standard threshold for uh, the Passive House Institute's standard building. So for instance, Winthrop Center is, um, we're analyzing almost a million square foot of office space in that project in Boston, far surpassed the, the um, 38 kBTU or the 120 kilowatt hours per meter square per year. Um, Star Garments, which was, a, it's an industrial factor, a textile factory in Sri Lanka, um, way surpassed it at 344 kilowatt hours, almost three times what the threshold is. But we followed the heating demand thresholds, we looked at the cooling demand thresholds, and we reduced the energy use as much as humanly possible for what's available in the market today, with the best technologies available, and we were able to move forward with their support. So these types of projects are very important to, to let people understand that it doesn't matter how large and complex your project is, we can apply the concepts and help you realize significant energy reduction compared to what you would have uh, used to begin with if you just built standard uh, business as usual case. 
So the other thing that we really were involved with, and, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, was that it was very important for us to show them an array of potential solutions for meeting the passive house standard that we had used, analyzed, costed out on other projects to help them make the quickest decisions to what would be used on this project. The, the time frame is very tight. Um, it's not like you can say to a student, ah, your house isn't ready until December this year, right? It has to be ready on schedule for a dormitory. So speed, durability, energy efficiency, all of these things come into effect. So when we show them the array of salade, uh, facade selections, excuse me, facade selections that we had available that we had analyzed in the past. It's not necessarily that they're going to choose the cheapest. They have to balance all of the other criteria as well. So we were able to show them a number of facades, a whole array of windows that had been analyzed, and as long as, uh, as well as mechanical systems, we provided them with uh, similar uh, charts like this, cost comparison charts, and not just cost, right? It's what are the pros and cons of these issues, of these particular pieces of equipment? How quickly do they go in? Are they efficient enough? Are they gonna have a problem with the air tightness requirement if they go through the wall? Things like that. So these types of summary systems, of summaries of systems are really key in helping them understand the options out there and what they should choose to meet their goals. And I mentioned facades. So these are three very different types of facades that we have analyzed that are currently either in passive house projects that have been built or under construction at the moment. The left-hand facade is what was used at the Cornell Tech, the house um, that is certified passive house project. It was a panelized wall system that hangs from the slab, uh, custom fabricated from the wall, wall panel manufacturer and shipped to the site and lifted for crane. The one in the center is for one of our other passive house projects that is using a very traditional steel frame, concrete superstructure, and, and brick facade, masonry facade. Very common construction method in the city. And we just showed them pros and cons of all of these different things, speed, cost, durability, thermal bridging requirements. All of those things came into play when we chose what we were actually gonna go with. Um, and then the one on the right is the Winthrop Tower, the office space I told you about, which is a typical curtain wall detail and how we developed that and analyzed that to meet the passive house requirements. So just a number of solutions that are available and it will depend on the project which system is chosen. So once we did that, we started to analyze the requirements of the RFP with respect to sustainability and what passive house meant as far as increasing cost or changes in efficiency levels. So the, the RFP requirement was for tier three of the Toronto Green Building Standard. And what we did was we created a, co a comparison chart, efficiency comparison. So on the left, you see the tier three minimum requirements that they would have had to have installed for to meet that, that standard. So it's a good standard. It's not, it's, there's it's no slouch of a standard. On the far right is the passive house requirements that are probably above and beyond what would have been required for tier three. And then in the center was the overlap. And we were really surprised and pleased to see that tier three actually required a lot of things that would be required for passive house. So increases in cost weren't necessarily you know, tenfold or, you know, double what we would thought they would typically be because so many of this stuff was actually required for tier three. For example, one of the bigger cost items to go from a baseline building, multifamily typically, to a passive house building is energy recovery ventilation with supply air to all the living spaces. And that is actually a requirement of the tier three program and of UTSC's requirement for the project. So we didn't have to count that as an additional fee for the project. So this was a very interesting overlay to show us what the increase in efficiencies and the increase in cost would be to actually get to the passive house level compared to tier three. Then as we were doing this and we were evaluating cost increases over the project budget and really trying to bring the cost down to stay within what UTSC's goals were, they asked us to evaluate their standard for, mo for their buildings, their typical standard, which is 40% better than ASHRAE 2013. And I honestly will tell you, the minute they said this to me, I knew it was going to be impossible. 
um, because I have done enough a number of ASHRAE comparisons to passive house large scale passive house projects, and they don't come close to 40%. They're really great buildings. They're super energy efficient, but that 40% threshold is a bit. What do I want to say? It's a bit um, misleading, right? It's 40% over a fictional baseline, not necessarily what your typical baseline is. So you build this baseline according to ASHRAE standard, and then you compare your building. But there's certain things that you're actually not allowed to take credit for, which decrease the potential for you to, to track energy savings. Or, and ASHRAE actually, this is a cost saving measure. So they look at cost. So if you're doing an electric baseline building, compared to a gas baseline, you're actually gonna see less cost savings, right? Because electricity is more expensive. So it gets very complicated and convoluted. Um, the things you're not allowed to take credit for are air tightness, which is one of the passive house's great strengths, right? You're gonna be super airtight compared to a conventional building. Um, lower plug loads, they, they're the same in both the, the baseline building and your building. And then ventilation efficiency. And that's one of the things we push very hard is for extra high ventilation efficiency. So um, if you can't take credit for all of these things that are really um, a big part of passive house, then how do you get that 40% savings? It's very, very difficult. So if you look at the chart here on the right, I just wanna pull your attention to a couple of lines. So what we did was we evaluated the current passive house design, which included air source VRF system for the mechanical heating and cooling, to their conventional design of a four pipe fan coil unit. Now keep in mind, it's the same shell. It's the same exact passive house windows, walls, everything is the same except for the heating and cooling system. Even the ventilation is the same. So what we found was that um, when you compared them from a cost end for the cost savings, the four pipe fan coil unit was 26% better than the ASHRAE baseline building. And the passive house building was only 21%. However, if you look at the actual energy use, pred predictive energy use, the passive house building uses less energy. So you see what the problem is with that comparison. We have a better building in the passive house building, but the conventional design with the four pit fan coil is showing better savings. Um, and, it, and it's even further uh, defined when you look at the greenhouse gas emissions. So the passive house building is almost half, not quite half of what the proposed. So for UTSC, even though their standards have, you know, 40% better than ASHRAE was their norm, we, we tried to explain to them, look, forget your norm for this type of building. You're going to get, you're going to meet your greenhouse goals, reduction goal, better with a passive house building more quickly. You'll realize the savings more quickly with a passive house building than you will following that ASHRAE baseline methodology because passive house sets a threshold that you can't exceed. ASHRAE does not. It's the, all about this comparison. So this was a really crucial point too for the university to see this. And, and I believe that the passive house design, mechanical design was actually cheaper than the four pipe fan coil unit. From the experience I have evaluating VRF systems, air source VRF systems to electronic four pipe fan coil units that need boilers and uh, cooling towers, when you put all of that pumping power and everything in there, the actual the VRF design is more efficient and more uh, cost effective than the four pipe fan coil unit in most situations. So to touch on cost just a little bit more, um, we actually studied, we've, we've had the good fortune over the last couple of years to gather a lot of cost data for some of our passive house projects. We have a number of projects going at this, at this time and we had good development costs for 16 of those current projects and they're all uh, probably mid to high rise. The lowest is six stories and then we go up to 37. And the smallest is 30,000 square feet, approximately 30 units. And then the biggest you can see is almost 10 times that, right? On average, these numbers are good averages. I think for what you'll see in the majority of the projects that I'm gonna show you in the next table, which has a summary. But our increase for passive house ranges from 1% minimum to 8% maximum, on average 4%. And here's what each of those projects looks like. All right, I sorted them in order of average increase over the cost over, over their baseline building to go to passive house. And so there's a couple of things I'd like to point out on this slide for you. One, the majority of the projects fall between three and 5% increase. 
And that is historically over the last several years, I would say at least five to six years, what builders and developers have been telling us. The cost premium to go to passive house is somewhere between three and 5%. So you can see that this is, um, you know, a, a pretty standard number. And I actually still think that there's a little bit of fear factor still being baked into that number. A lot of times the fear factor is on the, the air leakage side, right? They don't know if they're gonna meet those goals. But there's a lot as, as a consultant, that passive house consultant you can do to help alleviate those fears. Um, one thing I do want to point out is almost all of the projects, I think actually all of the projects, I just put these notes in here, we won't touch on those notes at this time for this, this uh, presentation, but almost all of these projects have project teams that have at least two or more experienced Passive House members. Some of them go up to four, um, and it's not always the same. Sometimes it's the MEP and the design, the uh, Passive House consultant. Sometimes it's the architect and the MEP. Sometimes it's the builder and the consultant. So the combinations change. But in many of these, we have three or more. The teams keep coming together to reproduce the findings that they've had and the cost savings that they've realized and, and replicable systems over time. And that's another thing that keeps the cost down. Um, the people who were up in the over 5% range, were, they had pretty particular reasons why. Uh, one of them was uh, for the very large building, an inexperienced builder with passive house. We had an experienced two members on the team, you know, the architect and the consultant. But what we found in the cost estimate was that they added a lot of cost for extended construction period. And very truthfully, that is not typical of a passive house project. We generally do not extend the, the project schedule by maybe more than a day or so if we want to do some interim testing where we want to, you know, get the builder's help and, and close down a chunk of the building for that day. But other than that, Passive House is usually not re responsible for any major delays in construction. Um, the other, uh, the next team had a very complex facade. Um, there's a lot of angles to the building, a lot of balconies, a lot of uh, curtain wall facade, including rain screen facade, a lot of connections that need to be thermally broken. It's so very, very complicated. And that's one of the reasons why this one is, is more, is in the 8% range because Passive House had to deal with so much of that inefficiency in the facade. It's a beautiful building, but it's still, the facade is, you know, very, very complex. And then the last team decided, they were, they were responding to an RFP pro process and they decided at the last minute that they wanted to go to Passive House. And the, we were the consultant, we were the only ones on the team that were familiar with Passive House. And since they hadn't done it before, they sort of threw a really high cost to that um, fee because they didn't know. But I know for a fact from the type of building it is, the construction methods that they're looking to use, it's not gonna be in the 8% range. I know it's gonna be in that three to 5% range. So that's our analysis of uh, costs for a number of really large scale projects. And, um, you know, we, we find that UTSC is realizing similar costs in that room for Passive House. So it was good news when we got the cost estimates on that. Um, and so I'm going to pass it back over to Deborah, and she's going to talk to you about some of the remaining challenges that we faced once the decision was made to go forward. And um, she's going to give you a nice tour of all the really cool projects. Deborah? Okay, thank you so much, Lois. And also, I really do want to thank Jennifer for all that really great context at the beginning. And it really helped to set up this really groundbreaking project here. And so now we're going to talk about the project challenges that affected the design of the building. So first, we always have supply chain problems that we're trying to overcome. Now, it's been very interesting to see how supply chain problems have been lesson since we did the Cornell project, really a lot more choices out there. Even people's websites are getting more developed as we go on to them to search for products. There's more choices, which is incredibly encouraging. I've watched the Stephen Winter window Excel spreadsheet go from just a couple of windows to now we have quite a few choices, which is really, really very encouraging. And they're domestic now as well, which is also very encouraging. So we had to overcome still, though, some of these supply chain problems for this colder climate, this climate zone six, which makes our windows need to be extremely low U values. We'll share those with you as we go on. We also have a unique feature in this project, which is the dining hall. 
which requires extremely intense energy use. Um, there's actually a separate model for the residential portion of the project, a separate PHPB model for the residential portion, and then for the public areas, which include this really energy intense use of a commercial kitchen serving all those meals per day. We also, as Lois reminded us, we have this problem of proving out constantly through the design, the building type, as well as the um, energy requirements of the university with the passive house criteria. And in addition to this intense cafeteria, we have this intense amount of people, a lot of heat coming off of these kids, a lot of refrigerators, That's, there's 756 refrigerators in this building. They're small, but they still are incre incredibly energy intensive. And so throughout the design, Stephen Winter is working with the Passive House Institute to adjust that energy intensity target. So now we're gonna take a little step back and we're gonna look a little bit of an overview of how we're gonna go ahead and achieve Passive House. One of the things at the very beginning of this project, now remember this project has this delivery method called design build bridging. As Jennifer explained, up front we have a design team that's designing the project and working with directly with the owner and a cost estimator and the architect, as well as of course all of our consultants, of which Stephen Winter is helping us and guiding us through design of the project. The next phase of this project, which we're actually in right now, is we've turned over the project to a DB contractor. They are now taking the project through to completion. So they have their own passive house consultant, RDH. They will also bring in a passive house certifier. The certifier is a critical step in um, reviewing the whole package, right? They'll review the whole package that will be created actually by RDH in this case. They'll be put, reviewing that package, making sure all the ducks are in a row, then it goes through to the Passive House Institute for final certification. So we wanna remember about this PH certifier. It is an additional cost and is a very critical um, assistance actually in getting the Passive House project through to Passive House certification. So starting out to design this project, we know that we need an extremely robust enclosure, not just facade, we need a robust facade as well as the roof, the foundation. We're gonna do all of our Passive House strategies that we all know, strive for as compact a shape as we can, not too many ins and outs, we're gonna understand that building orientation. Of course, it's in that PHPP model and we're accommodating for that. Carefully detailing for air tightness, thermal, thermal bridge-free construction. We're gonna select windows that have extremely low U values and in this case, triple glazed. Then we're gonna attack those MEP systems, make sure that we have a high performance, low energy heating and cooling system powered by electricity always ventilating all those spaces, those habitable spaces with fresh air, heat recovery, of course, balancing, and energy efficient, supply, uh, efficient equipment, lighting, and appliances. So I'm gonna walk you through a little bit about the plans of UTSC here. This is that Ellesmere Road on the south and that new military drive, which will be on the west. The main entrance to the project is on the corner, as we noted, to connect the building to the new North Campus area. Folks will come into a main sort of plaza area, we call. To the right is the entrance to the actual dormitory area, the elevators. And to the left opens up into this beautiful public space, the servery, as well as the dining hall, which overlooks a beautiful garden in the back. So you can see the survey is, is quite large um, as it necessary um, to accommodate all of the students. In the center here, at initially we wanted this to be a sort of a walk area, an area for very, very high intense frying. And ultimately 
this is the one thing <laughs> that we could not deliver is this high intensity kitchen area here for um, that type of food. So I believe now it's a salad bar, which maybe is healthier anyway, but we do have fries. So we have their fry stand, we have their burger stand, we have pizza, wood fired pizza, and all of those others. We will be using induction heating, uh, cooking here, as well as um, all sorts of energy efficient equipment. So these spaces are service spaces for the university. There's a security area, building services area, some event spaces for large dining or large conferences and such. There's student resource center, and then the gray is the back of house area. Note here that this is the loading dock area. Back here, this sort of dark band is kind of illustrating that the facade, the sort of thermal enclosure is coming around the loading dock. We consider that loading dock an exterior space. And this is a view looking south. So we're um, looking here at that beautiful dining hall area. We're looking from, there's a woodlot to the north, a sort of historic woodlot that the whole building kind of opens onto. The second floor will be a landscape terrace that all the students can look down upon. And behind these large windows, we'll see in the plan shortly, there's a community rooms that all overlook this beautiful forest in the foreground. And so here's a typical plan of uh, the university dormitory floors. What's really cool about this plan, this has nothing to do with Passive House, but it's still interesting to me as an architect. Um, the university has a requirement that there are three separate communities. We call them A, B, and C, but someday hopefully they'll have much cooler names. And we've been able to separate these communities so that they have a sort of environment that feels really kind of breaking down the scale of the large student population. You'll come off of the elevators, you'll pass by that community room that overlooks that woodlot. And then you sort of enter into a threshold for each community, passing by what we're calling a little nook space here and an RA. So there's both the sort of eyes on the street as well as a small um, community space and then you go into your community. So each community has their own threshold space and their own sort of identity. We were really excited about this. We're also the stair, although we're not showing a window here in plan, the stair does have a window that again overlooks that garden. So we're hoping to encourage the students to use that stair. And up here on the right, you get a sense for really how dense these rooms are. This is what we call a four bed suite. It's actually two rooms separated by a common bathroom. The students are all given their own millwork for a storage of their, of their things. Within the millwork, each student has a refrigerator. So we have four beds and four refrigerators in these rooms. So the University of Toronto Scarborough building will be fully Passive House certified, except for that loading dock. As you can see here, this is that loading dock, which is carved out. And it's really important to remember that in some of these projects, spaces can be carved out of the envelope. Sometimes we do this for retail spaces, spaces that are sort of unprogrammed, we're able to do that for. But do notice that within the envelope is that kitchen. Now, the university had asked several times in several different ways, <laughs> can the kitchen be carved out? Because it is quite a burden. But the answer is no, because that kitchen serves those students. And so it's integral to the program of the, the dormitory and the Passive Pass Institute will not allow that to be carved out. So what we're seeing here is that certified area is all green and that airtight enclosure is going all the way around the project. There is actually a small cellar, about maybe a quarter of the, of the building does have a small cellar, which would also show that it's in the certified area. So to the right, you get a close up of our facade system. 
we'll see detail on the next page, but our facade here is a stick built rain screen system. It is a sort of standing seam metal panel of different colors. And we'll talk about why we did this in another photo that shows it a little bit better. Um, but these are some general efficiency goals here. Our roof is R40, our walls are 30, and our windows extremely low U value of 0.13. So here's that section through the stick built rain screen system. The facade, as we noted on the outboard, is the standing seam metal panel backed up by insulation, clipped with a really nice Cascadia clip onto waterproofing, dense glass, more insulation, and then our continuous permeable vapor barrier. This says air and water barrier, but it's actually wrong. That is not right. The air and water barrier is this blue. So this line should be going to this blue, which perhaps it actually is. So what we want to note here is this is a stick built system. It is built on site. There's nothing really terribly fancy about this system at all. We um, actually submitted this system and then the design, very, very often different contractors have tried to what we call value engineer this system and it's, it's held up. This is um, what we believe and what, what's pricing out to be quite a cost efficient way of putting together this facade. Another way that we're really um, saving quite a bit of money and getting great thermal performance is through these UPVC windows. Now this is a nine story building. So um, we are able to use UPVC windows. In some of our high rise projects, we really can't because of the wind loads. But use these windows if you can because their performance is, is really far superior to an aluminum frame. Aesthetically, they have a little ways to go. They're a little chunkier um, and the colors are limited. At, but of course, one could do um, custom color, but that's going to really become quite expensive. But the UPVC is really um, working quite well. I'm actually using UPVC in a low income project that is not passive house, but it's really penciling out and really helping our thermal performance of the facade. And of course, we're using our triple glazing for the whole building, even the storefronts in this project. And so on the right, you're seeing here that rain screen, standing seam metal panel, windows are operable, the full, the full light of glass will tilt in for fresh air and will tilt, will, will open as well for cleaning. So this is a pretty cool slide that's, gonna, that's showing us here a standard window and the values. We're showing you the house values, which is climate zone four. And then we're showing the UTSC values, which are climate zone six. So as you can see, the glass and the whole window is really going down in the UTSC project. But what's really, I think, very interesting here is that SHGC value, which at the house, is actually lower because we don't want the heat to come in in the New York climate. But in the Toronto climate, we're okay with letting some of that heat come in. That's that, that higher SHGC value is allowing that heat to come in. So we're using that heat energy to help us lower the overall loads of the project. Very interesting for architects because the SHGC value really does change the, um, the look of the glass. A higher SHGC value is clearer. So we like high SHGC values. So it's, um, it's kind of nice to see that we can go higher here. Another thing we want to point out is that both the house and UTSC are using this warm edge spacer in the IGU, in the glass unit. Um, we note up here that a standard window has a metal spacer. That's the piece of metal that separates the lights. The, simply by specifying a warm edge spacer, even in your non-passive house projects, you can really increase the, or decrease the U-value of your windows and increase the performance. So we would really recommend specifying that warm edge spacer. 
So this is an, a photo of the actual blower tour test at Cornell. We'll be setting this up for UTSC project as well. Well, RDH will with that consulting group, but we'll certainly be there on this day with our wine glasses to celebrate um, when we hit our final blower door test, which will both pressurize in and out and show that the building has allows a maximum of 6.6 .6 air changes per hour. So now we're gonna get a little bit into the mechanical systems at the UTSC project. Um, we are using a VRF system, which is a variable refrigerant flow system of which the main components of that system are a condenser and what we call an evaporator or in this case, a fan coil unit. So these two items need to be connected. They're connected with refrigerant and the condenser needs to sit in an outdoor space. Um, perhaps you remember at the Cornell project, we have these condensers in a balcony because that building is 26 stories. This building is only nine stories. So it's super, super easy. We can just put those condensers right on the roof. We're dropping that refrigerant down. It's serving two of these fan coils that are mounted in the ceiling. And then that refrigerant is going right straight up. Very, very minimal amount of refrigerant runs. I, I really, really like this um, refrigerant delivery system here. It's, um, it's very tailored and very, very um, cost efficient for sure. And so you can see that every room has their fan coil unit. Um, actually, let's look, let's focus here on this room. This is a that four bedroom suite that we looked at before. This has one fan coil that's going to serve both rooms. This is just a, as well, will serve both rooms. For a single unit, you'll have one fan coil serving one room. So as Lois was talking about cost, you know, this was a cost analysis that we did specifically for this job in the DD phase we had a, a cost um, consultant on our team. And this is really, really interesting and where um, really opened our eyes here. This is our project, the UTSC project. We have two comparable projects. We will say these comparable projects were multifamily. They were not university housing projects. But we're showing here the four pipe and the two pipe fan coil. And look at these prices. It's pretty cool that the plumbing price for the fan coil was coming in a little bit lower than the four pipe and a slightly higher than the two pipe. These prices are all relatively, I think we could say at a 50%, at a 100% DD phase, we're seeing here, these are all pretty much the same. So we're not gonna let our clients tell us that VRF is by default more expensive because it is not necessarily. Right, it does of course compare, depend on what you're starting with, but let's, let's make sure that we keep open and keep everybody open to the use of VRF as it, we know that it is very effective. And so then ventilation, there are two sort of general strategies to ventilation. There is the unitized, which means that every unit would have their own ventilation system their own sort of packaged energy recovery ventilator that would deliver fresh air coming from the outside and then pull back the exhaust air and exhaust it to the perimeter. We know we've tested the system quite a few times um, and for costing as well as just practicality, this system for um, a dorm project, even for multifamily of uh, project gets very uh, maintenance intensive, right? You will need to have a, somebody come to that unit say three times a year to change those filters and to um, maintain that that energy recovery ventilator we're also really concerned with the amount of penetrations through our lovely facade that we've just designed to be so thermally tight we're a little bit worried about that and then also we have to clean these vents so the cleaning effort would require a, a, a um, window washing system so we're it's for those reasons that we opt 
primarily, we owe all of our multifamily, we've used a centralized system. And the system has sort of your traditional exhaust risers going to the roof. What's new here is that you see supply risers coming in down through the building to provide that fresh air. And so here we see a little diagram of how that air is working. This is again, one of those four bed suites. We see a single riser serving that suite, delivering the fresh air to each room, and then one common exhaust, which will come through underneath the, the bathroom doors into that exhaust riser. All that exhaust will be captured at the, just before the, it goes through the ERV at the roof. The exhaust air will go out. The heat will be pulled off of it, not the air, the heat. And then that will temper that incoming air and deliver it to the units with say a MERV 13 um, filter on that air. So MERV 13 providing this really, really healthy interior environment 24 seven to all the inhabitants. So what we've found here is that the, this is a study in some of the benefits of passive house with both cost for electricity as well as greenhouse gas emissions in this building. So remember, all of this is at 100% DD. And what we're showing you here is that we're estimating the add at 100% DD for passive house was about $1.5 million, which was 2% of the overall estimate. So there was this moment when we're really deciding to $1.5 million, are we able to invest that money? And this is something that the university really has toiled with. And we have made concessions in other areas. There is no doubt that other things, that basement got smaller. As I noted, the basement's about maybe 25%. It wanted to be bigger. Of course, storage has suffered always <laughs> in all of our apartments too, I'm sure, and our homes, but storage has suffered. And there are, there are certain programmatic aspects that did get cut in order to meet this, this goal of adding this $1.5 million. And so we're showing you here this 18 year payback. It's a long time for sure, but for a university that builds to hold, maybe it's tenable. And um, then we're showing you here the greenhouse gas emission. Um, the SB10 building, that is that tier three base building in the Toronto code. We're showing you that a base building, tier three building has a 2006 ton CO2 per year. And our, our building will have 154, which is a savings of 52 tons per year and 25% less. We actually thought this should be higher but we've double checked and it's not. So this is our GHG emission savings. And so in summary, we have to remember the user, right? And I think it's really important for architects as well as all of our consultants to remember that these projects are really about the user, right? I mean, we want to create this incredible experience for the user. We want to bring in all of these aspects of Passive House, but also great design and great support systems, great spaces, great everything. So we always wanna be selling our projects both for the passive house aspects, but let's remember how it ties into the user experience. I think that is the way to show an owner how critical passive house can be in both enhancing their message and also enhancing the experience for the user. Up on the right here, that's that nook area that we've designed as the threshold into the communities. And then on the bottom here, we see a typical dormitory room. And so that is our presentation for today. I wanna to really thank Lois and Jennifer.